one-time event, but an ongoing thing that takes place. Uh, the book of Revelation says that the lack of repentance is a characteristic of the damned. <laughs> like, ooh. You know, so if we're not repenting, right, if we're not able to repent, we know what's going to happen. Um, and so when we're called to repent, how do we respond? Right? It's an important thing in life of the church. How do we respond to things? Right? Um, and so confession is the way to commune with God when that communion has been broken by sin. Um, but before we get into forgiveness of sins and confession and all that stuff, let's talk about sin itself for a few minutes. Uh, I'm sure you know the Greek word for, for sin is amartia, to miss the mark. Right? Um, so as Christians, the mark or our target uh, that we aim for is a Christ-like life. And one lived to the best of our ability, and our lines, our teachings, the precepts, the commandments of God. Um, and when we miss this mark, we fail to hit the target, we sin. Well, murder is a sin. Pride and envy are sins. Stealing a car is a sin. Stealing a candy bar is a sin, right? Refusing to attend liturgy is a sin, but also attending liturgy with hatred for other people is a sin. So it's all kind of mixed up in this. But missing the mark is missing the mark. Whether you miss it by an inch or by a mile, you still miss it, right? Um, if we aim for the bullseye and we miss it, it makes no difference if it's an inch or by a yard. Um, in both cases, we fail to achieve that we've strived for. Um, now, obviously, there are more severe sins. Murder and stealing candy bars are not on the same level of severity, right? Um, but the point that both these things, both something major and something minor, separate us from God if we choose not to do His will. Um, and sin is kind of an interesting thing because whenever it's used in explanations, it's always um, kind of a spoiling of the good, a negation of something good, right? So if you have, if you miss the mark, it assumes there's a target, right? Um, you have a trespass, means there's a law, you've trespassed it. Uh, if there is impurity, it assumes something was originally pure, right? If you, have, if you fall, you fell from somewhere, right? There's always a negation of something good. Um, and so for us, the, this idea that, um, s that sin um, is not just something, one law we break and we have to be punished for, but the church kind of explains it more in the lines of sickness. We're all sick, right? All different things. And we come to the church for healing. When you go to communion, one of the, there's different versions of how the priest says a prayer where he gives people communion, but one of them ends with for the healing of soul and body, because we're sick. When I was a kid, I always used to kind of uh, think it was interesting that when, you know, we would, um, you know, we were sick and mom gave you some rope and pestle on a spoon. That's what he gave you the medicine. And then we're sick with sin. What does Father do with us? He gives us communion on a spoon, right? The same kind of action for the same purpose of being healed, right? Um, and so the question is that, we, so we can establish what sin is. We all have it. Um, everyone has sin. I don't care who you are. If you don't, I'd, I'd love to talk to you because how are you doing it? Um, but we all have our stuff, right? And I think that everyone sins. There's, there's, no, there's no way around that. It's part of the fallen experience of our world. But everyone has different sins that affects them more than others. Everyone has that sin, which is the button the devil likes to push, right? I always like to tell people that, um, like, I am not a food guy, right? My wife always reminds me, did you have lunch today? I'm like, oh, I didn't have breakfast today either, you know? I just forget. And it's not a, you know, it's not my thing. We go to, like, a nice restaurant. It's like, wasn't that great? I'm like, I don't know. Food, it was good, I guess, you know, and she's all freaked out because, you know, she loves to have a good steak or something, and I'm like, eh, you know. But that's not my thing. Gluttony is just not my thing. I just don't think about food. Um, my thing is anger, right? Uh, and so I worked very hard, you know, I put my fist through a couple of doors in my life when I was a kid, and, you know, he's angry. And one time my mother told me when I was a kid, she says, how are you going to be a priest if you have a temper? What are you going to do? Blow up your parishioners at parish council meetings or yell? I'm like, oh man, I guess I got to do something about that. Uh, so I worked really hard, you know, to kind of keep that under wraps. But every so often, you know, that little green monster comes out. And one of these things of our sin is that sometimes we think we got under wraps, and then it manifests itself again. I'll give you an example. Several years ago, uh, it was a Saturday morning. I took the kids to breakfast. Uh, my wife could do her own thing. I said, I'll take the kids. We'll go to breakfast. We'll do a thing. So we took them to wherever we went, and, uh, pancakes or whatever else. And uh, we came home, and when I come in the front door of our townhouse, there was a table here where you put your keys and whatever else. And I put my, like, orange juice to go kind of right there, and, you know, I came back in, sat in my chair in the living room, and thought, Dad, I did my job. I took my kids to breakfast on Saturday morning, let Mom do her thing. This is great. And I hear this noise. Click. 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 I'm like, what in the world is going on? I'm 
walked down the hallway, and there's my then three-year-old Elijah with my orange juice with a straw going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah! And he drops it, and the thing goes everywhere. <laughs> you know, like, you know, and I haven't gotten that angry in years. My wife comes in, she goes, sit. Kids are like, shh, 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 hiding, you know. But I thought to myself afterwards, like, yikes. You know, how easy it is to set us off for our sin. And so the idea is that how do we identify these things that afflict us, these sicknesses that are sometimes deep down inside of us? And then how do we admit to ourselves first that we are guilty of these things and then go and confess them in front of someone else? It's hard. Um, Father, if you would hand these out for me. Sure. There's... Um, one of the things that we, I don't think we do a very good job of sometimes is preparing for confession. Our church tells us all the time about preparing for communion. We have prayers we say and that kind of thing. What about coming to confession? A lot of times when people come to confession, you know, we all do this. I think we have like confession amnesia, right? You have it all figured out. You come to confession, you're like, <laughs> you forget, right? Um, and so what I try to do is tell people to read things over, challenge yourself about different things, write things down if necessary. Ask yourselves these questions. And the church has these like, nice little confession kind of, kind of pamphlets go through, asking questions like from the Ten Commandments and how it applies to your life. And then you can kind of formulate in your head what you've fallen short with. So when should we go to confession? Another good one. Um, you know, create a special time. Um, you know, when we were kids, uh, we went once a month as a family. I always would wonder what the priest thought, because you know, here comes the Honiki family, right? You know, probably all said the same thing, because you're all like, you know, families like each other, whatever. Uh, but then we always go out to dinner afterwards. So, it's like, so I associate confession with a family event because it was something that we did together. And so you have to create a, a special time to go, you know, um, every month, every six weeks, during the four fasting periods of the year, whatever your piety is, depending on what your, your priest has told you. Um, it's important that we come. When I first got to Mechanicsburg and I was kind of pushing this thing, everyone need to come to confession, please come to confession. And this lady came to confession and I said, you know, what's burning your heart? Nothing. Do you have any sins? Nope. Why are you here? Because you told me to come. I thought, all right, we had a plus a point for obedience, but we're going to talk about how this is supposed to work, right? Um, and so for us, not every sin requires a, a formal penance through sacramental ritual of confession. We sin all the time. We can't remember all the times we've sinned. Um, and I think sometimes even if we have like a little priest in our pocket that we confess every five minutes, we still miss stuff because we're constantly falling short. But it's obvious that, you know, um, that we're never without sin. We sin all the time. But we need to rem like, try to remind ourselves when those things come across that, that burden our hearts. Um, we need to pray to God to give us the wisdom to see those things um, and to be gentle with them. Um, you know, one of the fathers said that if, if all of our sins were revealed to us all at once, we'd all just commit suicide. We'd just be falling in despair. But if we see everything, we just say, there's no hope for me. And then we just, whatever. And so we ask God to reveal these things to us in time. Um, and I said that before, that confession is not a one-and-done thing. It's, it's a process. And it's going to go to the time that we hope that right before we die, the priest can come to us and confess us again. It's a whole process, our whole life, that we're kind of getting this stuff out of our system. Um, but it's kind of like when you have um, you know, a sickness, it takes some time to work through. And you have to confess these things sometimes several times because you fall back in the same things again. Um, but so, you know, we've, I'm sure I've said a dozen times since I left home this, this afternoon, and there are things we forget. All the things that we kind of grumble at the nut driving next to me in the traffic today, or, or why hasn't, you know, that happened, whatever, you know, you, you start church on time, but I can say, if I didn't start church on time, I'm going to man about that, or who hit the remote, or something. The little things we call it, right? Um, those irritable things our spouses do, this so-called little stuff, right? Sometimes we think, ah, that doesn't make a difference, don't worry about that. But that little stuff sometimes is the seed that really starts to kind of germinate something more serious. Um, so we ask God to be merciful to us so often, and ask sincerely, God be merciful to me, a sinner, all the time. Um, forgive us of word and deed, those known and unknown, knowledge or ignorance, because sometimes we're doing things we don't even realize it. Um, and so I think that, you know, there are more grave sins that, uh, or the prolonged separation from communion that require us to come back to sacramental penance, to come to the church and to confess it. 
And Christians living in communion with Christ are expected to make use of this sacrament. This is not like a, an optional kind of thing. This is part of our life. Um, and so we have to humble ourselves and consciously come before God and receive the guidance of the church to kind of continue this Christian life in a proper way. Um, and for my perspective, or Father Ignatius' perspective, we're not, like, the priest doesn't sit there with a clipboard, like, checking off. <laughs> and that's how this works, right? Um, it's a chance for the priest to try and assist the spiritual development of, of his flock. Um, you know, I've had, in 17 years of being in Mechanicsburg, I've had three or four, you know, major issues where, like, marriages fell apart and, like, you know, the divorce and everything else. And I can see every one of those situations that people do not come to confession at all, or, or regularly. And so how do I, as a priest, know what's happening to help people? I mean, God has given me many gifts, but clairvoyancy is not one of them yet. So I don't know what's happening in someone's life if less I'm told. And that's part of what confession is. If I hear someone's coming again and again and again saying they're really angry in confession, okay, what's the issue? We've got to talk about this. That is the catalyst for me as the pastor to help the person with the particular sin. Um, but if I don't know that, you know, this is not magic. We don't play magic and games here. You know, there's something that really practical that takes place between a priest and his spiritual children that comes forward when they confess their sin. Um, so when these things happen, when we have these feelings in our heart that we've you know, fallen short, that's when we, we come. Um, and so the Synod of the Bishops of the Orthodox Church in America a few years ago put out an encyclical, and they said, you know, every six weeks or so we should come, at least, you know, um, not as a dogmatic rule, but as an encouragement to the faithful to make this sacrament part of their spiritual life, something that you know we have to talk over with your spiritual father and find out how that works. When I was in seminary, I went every Thursday because my spiritual father didn't uh, didn't uh, serve uh, that night, and so when the vespers happened, I go up, go to confession. That was great. Now as a priest in a parish, I miss that because you know I can't just you know hear my own confession. I mean that's kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't have a priest right next door, and the one that is next door is my best friend, so it's kind of weird. So, you know, uh, it, it's harder to do that. Um, so when you have a priest that's here, take advantage of it. Um, and so there are three main elements to the act of formal penance in the church. First one is sorrow, right? You've got to be sorry for what you've done, right? There needs to be a sincere sorrow for the sins by the breaking of communion with God. If someone comes just ho oh, home, confesses, I did this and that, whatever, but has no intention of stopping. Well, the sin isn't forgiven, right? We can't fool God. That's one of the things about the, 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 the priesthood. Uh, St. John Chrysostom says the priest has more power, power than an emperor. He just rarely uses it, right? Because while we are given the blessing to forgive sins, we're also given the blessing to retain them. I went to that, I think, twice in my entire priesthood where someone came to confession, and I said, you know, are you sorry for this? Well, not really. Okay, well, I guess we're done here because I can't give you the prayer of absolution. You're not sorry for your sin. That's, that's how this works, right? And until this is forgiven, we need to, you know, kind of, you know, for, do something about this. Um, and so we can't fool God. You know, people can come to confession and say, oh, I'm so sorry for this and not really feel it at all. I'm kind of dumb. Okay, God forgives and say the prayer or whatever else. But God knows what's in our heart. We're just going through the motions or whatever else. And so it's one of the things we pray for, that God would give us the, the heart to see our sins and to be sorry over them and would come and confess them before our priest, which is the second part. So we're sorrowful, and then we make the confession. We say it, right? Um, there's something that when we articulate our sin, it, it, it kind of lessens the power of the demons on us. We try to conceal it in us. They, they can kind of, their grip is closer on us. But when we actually say it, they can't hold on to it. Because we're not afraid, because the humility lets it all out. Um, it's one of the things that the demons, the only thing the demons can't replicate is humility. They can't pretend to be humble, they can't do it. Uh, so when we act with humility, it destroys their plan. Um, and you know, it's funny, but sometimes people are afraid they come to confession because they don't want the priest to think less of them. Like they, they confess a doozy, the prophets are going to think less of them. The God's honest truth is it's just the opposite. When people come and confess, like, some really difficult things. For me, like, I have that much more respect for the person because they trust me with this difficult thing. You know, when I was first ordained, it's kind of funny that, you know, the newly ordained priest is always sent around to do different things. Oh, he'll go, he'll go, he'll go. And so when people were sick or traveling, the young priest would go here, do this, and fill in, whatever. And this, um, this woman, who was probably in her, like, 
80s or 90s came to me to confession and said that she had committed an abortion like when she was like 18 years old. And when she came to confession, she was, I just thought she was elderly and everything else, but she was, you know, really, you know, kind of, she's crying or everything else. I could hardly hear what she said. But the fact that she had that, 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 that courage to do that, you know, the church book says, you know, there's a penance of this many years, whatever else. Go in peace. Right? She carried that sin in her life and then was able to confess that. Um, there's something powerful in that, that we as priests, when someone like, opens up their heart to us, it's a profound thing and a humbling thing for us. Because a lot of times I'm here in confession thinking, man, I wish I could confess like that. You know, like the people that are confessing to me, you know, I can do it better. Right? Um, and so we have to have an open, heartfelt confession of sins. Um, historically, remember that this was done uh, publicly before everybody in the middle of the church. How about that? <laughs> uh, but in recent times, it's usually done in the presence of the pastor or the priest that re represents the whole church. Uh, thank God for that development. Um, because the sacrament of repentance developed early in the church's history, the time of the persecution, maybe third, fourth century, that kind of thing. Uh, and when the context was when people were being oppressed by, because of their faith and were like, you know, opting to leave the church, to say, oh, I don't believe in Christ and would leave. And then when all that kind of cooled off and they wanted to come back, the church had to figure out, well, how do we reinstate these people to the church? They committed apostasy. They said they didn't believe in Christ. Now they want to come back in. What are we supposed to do? And they said, well, have them come before the community and tell the community, I did this. And I'm sorry for this. And have the community forgive them. There was a debate before that. Some people didn't want to receive the people back in the church at all. But obviously mercy went out and this is what happened. Um, and so the big, the big three in the early church was murder, adultery, and apostasy. Those are the big three that would formal act of you know, confession in front of everybody. Um, but what happens is the church kind of gets bigger and everything else, and so the person gets up and confesses it, and then after church, can you believe it? Oh, so did. Man, I was really terrible. And then, you know, it becomes more of a, like a thing, and so the church says, okay, the clergy will represent the church, and they hold on to it. And so, as priests, we can't say anything to what is said in confession. And I remember in the uh, Archbishop Michael de Hulich, when we were in uh, seminary, we asked him, what if someone says, on the penalty of going to jail, he said, lock me up. Um, but that's how serious it is, that we as clergy, we, we can't tell anybody. Um, when I was in seminary, I asked Metropolitan Theodosius one day, I had to pick him up from the airport, and I asked him, I said, Vladika, how do you hear a confession? Like, how do you hear a confession and, like, not think about it all the time? Someone said, like, killed somebody or something terrible. And he says, you just learn how to forget. I'm like, what is that again? But, you know, it, it just, it works that way. When someone comes to confession, uh, you know, when I'm done, I go on the altar, I kiss the altar, I say, Lord, you take it all. And I don't think about it afterwards. So much so that someone will come to confession later on and say, Father, remember the thing I told you? I'm like, yeah, uh, that, the thing you told me. Uh, were you listening? Well, I was listening, but I'm not thinking about it all the time. Because if I was thinking about it all the time, I'd probably go crazy. I have 160 people I'm worried about all the time, right? Um, and so, you know, it's never something to be afraid of. Never be afraid of confessing your sin to your priest. Um, that's why in the Orthodox Church we have a relationship with our pastor. You know, I used to love it when I was in Catholic school. I, mean, I, I, grew, I was Orthodox my whole life, but we went to Catholic school for 12 years. And I used to sit, at the, we'd have these like reconciliation services before Christmas and Easter. And I'd sit in the, this big cathedral church and watch all the kids go to confession and think, this is you go before this little screen, you know, and you kind of like change your voice. You wouldn't know you'd done it. We were there. There's all these different priests you never saw before. I'm like, man, this is easy for us. We got to the guy knows us. I know him, you know, you know. But as I got older, I realized, no, there's wisdom in that because the person knows you. Your priest knows who you are. He knows your faults and your weaknesses and whatever else. <laughs> and you know his too. Um, but there's something beautiful in that that. You know, being in the parish as long as I have, that you know, people will come to confession. They just kind of look on their face and like. I know. I got a pardon, David. I just know already, you know, because of what they struggle with. And I have to confess it so much as I know what they're coming with. Um, but that comes from a relationship. And again, to come before someone in humility, not to pretend you're somebody else. Or, you know, there's people that do that. And as priests, we know people do that. If you do that here, please don't do that. Go to different priests for this or that, or, you know, Lenten services. Oh, Father, you're coming to confession, so I don't go to my priest. If, that's the, if you're doing that, you miss the whole point. Because the whole point is that you have humility to go before your spiritual father and confess these things. Not try to hide it and get a, pull a fast one on God, because we can never do that, right? Um, 
And so this, this idea of the confession uh, to the church, to the priest, um, would be like a second baptism. A re relapsed person would come back in the church by this confession of sin. So every time we come to confession, it's like a renewal of our baptism. Because the idea the Father says is our tears, we say sorry for our sins, we weep, that would be the waters of our baptism. Um, and they go so far as to say that the, water, that the tears of repentance are more powerful than the waters of baptism. That's heavy. We'd be so sorry for our sins that we confess it that the Lord would see our contrition. And then the third thing that happens, our sorrow, our confession, is then the prayer of absolution, the priest saying the prayer. Um, you know, what happens a lot of times when, my, when um, you know, in our area we have orthodoxy is very new in mechanics, where they have no idea what to do with us. And so when people come to our church, they have all these kind of questions about it. You know, and one of the things they would ask is like, well, why do you have to say this prayer? Why does the priest have to say a prayer? I can confess to God. You can, and you should every day. I think you were supposed to in the prayer book. You can go through your, your day and all the sins you've, uh, you've committed, you confess to God, sure. Uh, but I asked the person, Did, Does God ever respond to you and tell you, Your forgiveness? Did he ever do that? No. no. I represent him. And so my voice is his voice to the person saying, Go in peace. And it's interesting because modern psychology says that to hear a human voice say, You are forgiven, is a healing thing. And so, and the church figured this out in the fourth century. Modern psychologists now are like, whoa, we should do this. Like, come on, guys, catch up with us. Right? <laughs> um, but to hear the voice of the church say this prayer, a formal prayer of absolution to which the forgiveness of God through the Christ the sacrament bestowed upon the repentant sinner. Um, and this is a powerful grace given to ordained priests and bishops of the Orthodox Church to absolve and forgive sins, not by their own merits, right? Um, but by the power of God given to them through the grace of ordination. The Lord said in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, when he comes on Pascha, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And we had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And that grace given from the apostles to their disciples, to their disciples, their disciples, their disciples, their disciples, all the way down the line, is given to the clergy to be able to do this to forgive and to retain. Um, and so the fulfillment of this penance um, is the reception of Holy Communion. So we come and receive communion to kind of reunite us with God when we've separated ourselves. The Eucharist is the completion of everything in the church, right? It's like the, the greatest thing we can do. And the and genuine reunion with the repentant sinner with God and the whole community. Because remember, when you go to communion, you're not just coming to communion with the people in state college or whatever. Your communion with the entire church. We always talk about there's one chalice, there's one bread, there's one liturgy that the entire world is celebrating all in different places, but it's all the same time. It's one Christ. So you have to have this, this, um, this you have to mean it. Now, I'm not saying the sin will never happen again, right? We all know our sins, they happen again. Um, but we need to confess them when they happen again and get them out of our system and keep coming back to them every, and working on those things. And so the sacrament of, of penance, like, like all the mysteries of the church, is an element of the life of the church itself. But it presupposes there's a firm belief and conviction that Christ himself is present uh, through his Holy Spirit. Um, you need to have faith for this to take place. You know, one of the things that I always struggle with is when someone will go to confession and everybody else will say, well, Father, I still feel bad about it. Okay, you feel bad about it, but you have to believe that it happens. You know, if you don't believe that it happens, well, you know, do you believe that Christ can do this? Do you believe that Christ can forgive your sins? Um, often what happens, I think, too, is people don't forgive themselves. Uh, they can forgive the other person, whatever, but they can't forgive themselves for something. They have to kind of believe that Christ has forgiven them. But if you don't believe in the church, you don't believe the authority given the clergy, then you don't believe in the words of Christ himself. And if you can't believe in God himself at his own word, then there's nothing that will ever satisfy you. Um, and really, you become a God unto yourself. And a person without the experience of Christ in the church will never understand the meaning of sacramental penance and the need for the open and public of a confession of our sins. Um, and it's, it's such an important thing, though, that we, uh, that we have that, that, that um, what am I telling you the, the word, uh, the, the sense that we're not afraid to confess these things, that the priest isn't going to think less of us, that we're not going to go tell somebody, whatever. Um, it was interesting, I went to a, a clergy a meeting one time and uh, my first and last time I went to one of the clergy meetings, uh, and the rabbi was kind of uh, upset because 
He said, well, you, you preach, you just say a prayer and it's forgiven. And so if someone was uh, molested or, or murdered, you just forgive and it's over with. Are you talking to me? Because <laughs> that's not how this works at all. He said, well, that's how it works. I said, what, on TV? Um, and I said to him, if someone comes to me and says they committed murder or something, I'm going to say, oh, God forgive you, go in peace, everything's good. No, the person's still dead. You know, you need to go and confess to the authorities and make amends for you've done, apologize to the family, provide for them, whatever, and then we'll talk about forgiveness. I said, we don't just hand it out in whatever. You, sometimes you have to say, until this is fulfilled, we, we can't do this. There's responsibility that comes with confession. Why do you know that? Maybe it's this. Maybe, you know, that's how this works. There's a, the responsibility. It's not just magic. I say a prayer with my hand. Poof, you're forgiven. Well, you know, I didn't raise the dead. What are we going to do about that? Um, sometimes our sin affects the other person. Until we make amends with that, well, the, the confession or the absolution is withheld until such times you make those, those amends. Um, you know, this stuff is, is, is real, real thing. It's not just kind of made up, you know, go say a prayer, wave your hand, whatever, magic. It's real life in the church. We have to kind of understand this. Um, and so the other thing that happens with confession, too, is that that gives the priest an opportunity to maybe offer some counsel or say something helpful. Um, I once had a bishop come to me for confession. At the end, I'm like, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> you know, I mean, um, I'm like, good, all right, good, you know. Um, because when people come to you for confession, they expect you to say something. Sometimes I got nothing, you know. It's, it, I don't just make stuff up. If, if the spirit moves me and there's something to say, I might offer something, but if not, I don't. Uh, but hear this. Confession is not orthodox Dr. Phil. Father, here's how I feel, and I think that, you know, um, when there's like 16 people in line for confession, it's already 9 o'clock, and you're like just ready to fall out of the chair. Um, that's not what confession is. I always tell people, my, my analogy is, confession is like taking out the trash, right? When you take out the trash, you don't throw it and kind of go, hey, why do we have spaghetti? I don't remember. But you don't do that. You don't go pick and throw it. You just throw it out, right? You just say it, you're done with it. Um, you don't have to go through and explain everything to the priest and what you should do or what happened there. Um, you know, it was a dark and stormy night, Father, and I had on a green shirt. I mean, you don't have to get into that. Um, and you're not supposed to mention anybody else in your confession. You know, I know I robbed that bank, but Father Ignatius drove the car, so I had to go with him. No, let him confess his confession. That's his confession. we got to be really careful about that, because a lot of times, you know, I hear confessions, and I'm thinking to myself, what's your sin in this? I heard everybody else's sins, but what's yours? Um, because it's not about confessing to everybody else. It's about acknowledging your sin you confess before God and not giving qualifiers or quantifiers. Well, you know, I did this, but it wasn't as bad as that guy's thing. Who cares? What did you do? And what do you confess? What do you feel sorry for? Um, and so I don't need to know the time, the place, the weather, the setting. You know, it's what is your sin and move on. You know, it's, it's just drop it off and be done with it. Um, and so after this, you know, when the person comes that, you know, the, the priest, you know, when he's offering this kind of counsel or whatever he can, to, to point out things, say, well, how's your prayer life? How's your, your fasting? Or, you know, during Lent, what are you doing, you know, in, in your spiritual life? That's where the priest can, like, be the, um, it, it's like an art, uh, the priesthood, to kind of figure out what works for different people, because everybody's different. You know, I mean, I could have five people come and confess the same sins, and I might get five different, you know, kind of instructions because of the different personality and how they can handle it. Um, and so we have to be, you know, conscious of that. And you don't go and tell your, everybody else about what we talked about in confession. Just as I keep it a secret, so do you. It's not everyone else's business. You know? So if two people come to confession and they say the same thing, and I give two different, you know, advice because of the situation. Well, Father, you told her so and so and so. It's not your business because she's in a different situation than you, you know? Um, but it happens a lot. Um, and so we have to remember that when we come to confession, um, the priest is a witness. You're not confessing to me. You're confessing to Christ. Um, you know, Father, forgive me, I have sinned. Don't worry about me. That's the Roman Catholic thing, by the way. You know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, right? That's not what we're doing here. A lot of times, you, you notice when you go to confession, the priest stands like this. You're facing the altar. You're not facing me. I'm just the witness. I'm, just, I'm representing the church to hear what is being said. Um, but it's not about confessing to me. It's confessing to Christ. And so, I'm just a witness. Christ is invisibly present hearing these things. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when people struggle, you know, we sometimes can prod them a little bit and say, so, how's your 
prayer life, how things at home, how things with your relationships, whatever else, kind of reminding people of things. Like I said before, sometimes it's good to kind of write things down because we forget, you know. Um, and if the person, the priest, may be necessary to impose maybe a penance or something, uh, which I, I, I'll be honest, I've, I've rarely done. Um, but uh, it's still part of it. So sometimes, you know, it can be administered because it has to be healed. What's the pattern? Oh, well, so, um, well, it depends. <laughs> oh, baby, here we go. Um, so, you know, if something major has happened, sometimes a priest might say, okay, maybe you should abstain for communion for a period of time. Maybe you need to go and apologize to this person you offended. Maybe you need to return the money you stole or whatever um, to impose something you have to do or say this canon or these prayers or this psalm or whatever. Um, you know, Father Dan Restatar, blessed memory, was just a wonderful priest who passed away uh, last year. And whenever I went to confession to him, he would always give me a penance, but it was always something very light, like read a psalm or whatever. But that was his, his style, to make so you did something afterwards, right? Um, but it's not always necessary, but sometimes it is. Uh, that, okay, until this is fixed, you should do X, whatever. Um, and so it's uh, one of these things that the priest, as a, as a spiritual doctor, has to kind of figure out, where's the sickness? This is what needs to be done. If you have a problem with your computer, maybe you should turn the computer off, or you know, get rid of your phone, or delete Facebook, or whatever. That might be a penance given, that you need to get rid of this stuff. It's not helpful for you. And after this, the priest then takes the, the stole um, and puts it over the person's head. Um, you know those little fringy things in the front of the priest's stole, the long piece he wears around the front? Uh, all those little fringy things represent all the people in the church. All the, the people who have been trusted to the priest's care that he carries with him. Um, and in the, in the Roman Empire, the, the stole, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a Christian vestment, it was a pagan thing. The, 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 uh, the Romans would have the, the Roman emissary would wear this thing around his neck with, with insignia saying he was representing the emperor. And the Christians are like, hey, we like that, okay. Our, our, the, the, the priest represents Christ, will wear this, this kind of thing. And then if you look at it, like, the priest has one that goes around his neck on both sides, the deacon has it that comes around and hangs on one side, the subdeacon has a cross around here. Uh, it's the same vestment, just used differently. But it's the one vestment that a priest uses for everything. If, you know, if I go to the hospital, I at least have to have my stole or to bless something, whatever. I at least have a stole on. Um, so I'll, I'll hold everything for liturgy or vespers, whatever. But the stole, as if we took heal, is the thing that he needs for any, any kind of service to the church. And then the priest reads the prayer of absolution over the head of the person. I like the prayer of the, the, the Greek version of the prayer that, uh, better than the Russian just because of the, the way it sounds. Um, and it's more, in my, my opinion, more fatherly. Um, and the, the, the Slavic one kind of comes from a more of a Western influence, has like a Latin kind of tone to it, where the priest is in charge of everything. And by my power, I'm forgiving you. And it's not really our theology. Um, and so this is what the, the, the form of the Greek prayer says. It says, May God who pardoned David through Nathan the prophet when he confessed his sin, Peter who wept bitterly for his denial, the harlot weeping at his feet, the public and the prodigal, forgive you all things through me a sinner, hear it, through me a sinner, both in this world and the world to come, and set you uncondemned before his terrible judgment seat. Now having no further care for the sins you have confessed, depart in peace, and in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, and so there's important things mentioned there. All these times in Scripture where people confess their sin, were sorry for what they have done. Um, and then, you know, the priest saying, you're now set you uncondemned before his terrible judgment seat. Think about that. At the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to hear about this on Sunday, the book is opened, the deeds of all men are, are laid bare, written down. The Father's teach that when we go to confession, the co things we confess are blotted out of that book. So if we've confessed it, they're not going to be there. We've already given an account before Christ and the church in confession. But if we conceal them and we don't, then the book's going to be open. We have to give an account before everybody. Right? How terrible that would be. But that's the power of it, that these things are consigned to oblivion, assuming we don't go back to them. Um, in the ancient church, not all priests had the right to hear confession. Special confessors were appointed. Experienced monks or priests were entrusted with this responsibility. Uh, it's still true in some Greek churches. Um, in some of the Byzantine churches, that like diamond thing that hangs on the side is only given to priests who can hear confessions. Um, but um, 
from the 16th century on, however, most of the, the, the Slavic tradition, most priests were given the ability to be the confessor because they didn't have priests in these places, whatever. Um, but in many monasteries, an experienced monk wasn't even a priest, was a confessor. So it's not about necessarily confessing to the priest, it's just confessing to someone. You're telling someone what you've done. The priest obviously has to do the absolution part. Um, and it's, like I said, the, the modern psychology says that everyone needs one person they can be completely honest with without any fear or judgment to tell their entire life to. Really, guys, you're, you're catching up with this. This is good, right? I mean, the, the church, I mean, it, it drives me insane how we now, you know, we modern Americans who are so smart, we know everything, we're just catching up with what the church has been telling us to do for like 1,700 years. Um, you know, uh, just coming up soon, the, the modern, um, like, uh, dietitians say that every so often you should abstain from red meat and, like, and fatty foods. You just take periods of time off and on. Like, oh, really? You know? Okay. <laughs> you know, thanks, guys. You know? The fathers were telling us to do this for, for ages. You know? Not just because it's good spiritually, it's also good physically. And those things, we are body and a soul. So, it, you know, um, you need both those things. Um, but it's amazing to me that the wisdom of our Holy Church has been telling us that before the experts got involved, the experts are, are depicted on the walls of the church. They're telling us what was supposed to be done, and we've been doing it ever since. And the world is like catching up to us now. Um, and so, St. John Chrysostom, he says, only the priests, not even the angels, have been given by God the right to forgive sins and confession. And God has allowed the priest to be also a sinful man, for the sinful priest will best understand the sinful man. How beautiful is that? That the angels who don't sin, because they're angels, they don't hear confessions, and they can't give uh, absolution because they wouldn't understand people because they don't have experience. But a human who has sinned, who has fallen, who has been forgiven too, can then be better a person to hear a confession and to offer the forgiveness of God because they know. And God, knowing our weaknesses, allows this. It's powerful. Um, and so, how do we combat sins that constantly assail us? A disciple came to a certain elder one day and said, Father, I have fallen. The elder answered, Get up. Again and again he came to the elder and said, I have fallen. And the elder invariably answered, Get up. Until when must I continue getting up? The disciple asked. And the elder answered, Until the day when you give up your soul to God. And so, every time we fall, the sacrament of repentance tells us, Get back up. Right? Um, and I think that's an important thing for us, that, you know, there's nothing you can do that can't be forgiven if you ask forgiveness of it. Right? When you talk about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that's never forgiven, right? Well, what that is is when you, you don't think you're wrong and you won't ask for forgiveness of it. Well, he's not going to forgive you something you're not going to ask forgiveness from. But if you ask forgiveness of something you've done, of course he's going to forgive you. That blasphemy is saying, no one can forgive me. I don't need forgiveness because I know everything. Okay. Um, but anything we do wrong that we're sorry for and we come before God in sincere repentance, of course he's going to forgive us. See, the beautiful thing is, like, you know, in the world we live in, a court of law versus the church, right? So, you know, Sam, you have, let's say you have ten um, parking tickets, right? And you go up to the magistrate and you say, oh, I have these ten parking tickets and I did this. And they'll say, here's your fine, right? You admit it, they throw the book at you. That's how it works. In the church, we can say, I did this, I did this, 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 and you're only given mercy. The church says, ah, oh, it's the third time today. You don't do that. Only mercy. Um, and so there's something beautiful with that. It's kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, providential that this week we're doing this, uh, where we just had the, the Sunday of the Prodigal Son. And it's apropos because this is what we're talking about. The image we should have when we go to confession is that father. Now, think about it. We don't know what happened in the situation because it just starts out, Christ tells the parable and says, the son came to his father and says, give me my stuff, I'm going to leave. Uh, according to the Mosaic Law, um, that he pretty much now is dead to him. And there's some reference said that if he ever came back to him, the father could have put him to death for daring to come back to his presence after declaring him to be kind of dead to him, which he does, and he doesn't kill him. Um, but the father lets him go. He gives him his stuff, lets him go. Uh, and what's interesting is he doesn't run after him. He doesn't say, oh, please, son, stay away. I want to stay away. He doesn't do that. He says, all right, here's your stuff. And he doesn't go to the pig pen and drag the kid out, knowing that he's probably squandered it and riotous living and prostitutes and everything else. The other brother rats him out. But uh, he doesn't go and drag him out. He lets it be. But says that when he comes to his senses, 
I always picture it like he, um, he wrote it on his arm, he's practicing it, you notice he practices it before he goes back. Uh, and the thing that brings him back to his father isn't necessarily his remorse, it was his empty stomach and his empty wallet, you know, right? Um, which shows that even if our repentance is halfway, God will still receive it, because God is merciful. Um, but when he comes back, the father sees him from a long ways up and runs to him. Well, that's interesting, because any self-respecting Jewish man would not hike up his tunic and run to the son who just told him to drop dead a few days or a week before. He wouldn't do it. You come before the father and grovel before him, and maybe he'll let you live, because according to the Mosaic law, you could have been stoned for that, daring to come back into his presence. But he doesn't do that. He runs to him. He weeps over him. He hugs him. He's so happy he's there. And you picture the son saying, <coughs> Father, 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 <coughs> okay. I have sinned before heaven for thy face, the word they call thy son. And the dad cuts him off. Remember, there's a second part. Maybe one of your hired servants, he doesn't let him finish the sentence. Meaning, God does not want hired servants in his kingdom. He wants sons and daughters. And the beautiful thing is when he makes the confession, the dad should have said, from a human perspective, we were so worried about you, how could you have done this? We were devastated. Shame on you, son. He should have said all those things. But what does he say? Kill the fatted calf, get a ring and a robe and sandals, and let's have a party. He doesn't even address the terrible thing his son did. And the beauty is that when we confess our sins and we come back to church, the banquet that's thrown for us is the liturgy. And there's not a fatted calf that's killed. It's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, which takes away the sin of the world that is given to us as food for the faithful. He gives to us of himself. And so this is the, the, the image we should have of when we go to confession. This is who we're confessing to. You know, I think one of the problems we have uh, as Christians, we're like, um, we're infected with like um, American Baptist ideas of we do good, God blesses us, we do bad, God punishes us, and Jesus sits on a throne with lightning bolts telling sinners because he's angry at everybody. <laughs> That's just nonsense. And you read the church fathers, it's not consistent with that. And you have this, these, these weird ideas of how God kind of sees us. He's looking for us to step out of line and nail us because he's God and his righteousness needs to be the peas or some nonsense. Well, let me flip it a certain way. So I have four children, right? So until Nicholas makes amends for talking back, my judgment will be upon him. Until Elijah takes out the trash, my wrath will be upon him. Until my five-year-old cleans up his Legos, my indignation is upon him. I was trying to say it with my, my daughter, but she's too sweet. No one would believe it, so I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but as stupid as that sounds, I use that word very clearly, stupid as that sounds, that's how some people see God. Right? As a priest, one of the things I always say is that, you know, for the last many years, I deal with Christian PTSD, that people their whole life are just afraid of God because if we step out of line, it's going to nail you with something. Well, that's not the God we worship at all. Now, there is accountability. There is judgment. We're going to hear that on Sunday with the, the river of fire and the whole nine yards. We have to give an account for what we've done. Absolutely. But the mercy of God is greater than any of it if we come to him in repentance. If we can have that humility and come before him and say, I am sorry for this which I have done. God forgives us. God has mercy on us. And this beautiful parable explains it to us. And so we have to consider the, the meaning of sin and repentance. Uh, it's sin that separates us from God. Sin that plunges the soul into darkness. We often lose peace and joy and, and that kind of thing. I mean, you ever try to pray when you have something weighing on your heart that you've done wrong? It's hard. You know, if you're angry at somebody, you try to go to your icon corner and pray, you can't do it. You know, you're like, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. You know, you're thinking about that person, you can't pray properly, right? Um, and so we have to first acknowledge that we have sin, right? St. John the Evangelist, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, First John, for every man who sins falls short before the glory of God. Right? But then we come to our senses, we acknowledge that this is our sin, what we have done wrong, and we come before him and boldly confess it. You ever had something you're so sorry for, you cry over it? You know, there's tears of repentance. Like I said, those are more powerful than the waters of baptism because we've been so sorry for what we've done. We come before God with contrition, not just, oh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, whatever, whatever. You know, my boys are good with that. Yeah, sorry, Dad. As they're like doing the exact same thing I just told them not to do, as they say sorry, they go back to it. Like, you know, 
My, my father had a great line. He says, don't tell me you're sorry. Show me you're sorry. Right? And I think that's part of this. It's not just words, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to change that behavior? Are you going to change your life? Are you going to change that, what, that relationship? Whatever. And if you're not, it's not sincere repentance and it can't be forgiven. So, you know, it's not easy to confess our sins. Right? It's not a natural thing to willingly submit to discomfort, especially as Americans. Right? In our day and age, we feel we're cold, we turn on the heat. You know, if we ache, we run for Tylenol. Not just Tylenol, but rapid relief extra strength Tylenol. Right? You know, <laughs> fast food, we want that. Right? Um, anything bugs us, even minutely, we need to fix it now. You know, uh, my wife and I were watching some uh, show on Netflix. It was about like you know back in like the time of the settlers and everything else, and we were both kind of marveling that. These people lived in such rustic conditions, and for us, we're like, oh, it's so uncivilized. But that's like normal life for most of the world right now. If you have a roof over your head and air conditioning and heat and food in your, 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 your refrigerator, you're doing better than like 98% of the world's population. It's amazing. Um, but we're so used to like never being in any kind of discomfort at all. Why do we submit to being uncomfortable at confessing our sins? It, it's against you know, our, our whole ethos as Americans because we're always supposed to be the biggest and best and, and brightest and whatever. And here we're called to be the lowest and the most humble and to confess our, our, our sins, our, our, you know, our things we've done wrong, which we've never been done wrong. Lord, you would tell everybody we do right, you know. This is what I'm good at, you know, rather than saying, forgive me, I fell short here. I did this wrong. I should have done this differently. Um, and so, willingly, we go into a situation where we would open ourselves up to another person. It's a difficult moment. And I'm not saying this because, you know, as a priest, I've got it all figured out, too. I go to confession, too. And it's hard for a priest, too. And priests, when we go to confession, we go to take off our cross, and we kneel at the altar. And we hear our confession is given at the, the throne of God, even. That's daunting. You know? For all, and I have to give account for my whole parish. <laughs> you know, my deanery. God help me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So these are very difficult things, and we have to confess them. All of us do. I don't care if you're the patriarch or you're just charismatic last week. Everyone has to do this. But think about that if we, we showed this humility. If the world did this, right now with like, you know, Putin and, and, and Biden and Ukraine, whatever else, what if like an ounce of humility was in any of that? You know, the ecumenical patriarch, the Russian patriarch, this guy. It would change everything. How many parish meetings would be different if we all had humility coming forward to us? Right? But when we don't, that everything goes haywire. Because this was the problem from the beginning. Right? It was humility that saved the world, and it was pride that, that condemned it in the beginning. Um, every sin comes out of pride. You name it, it did. You know, gluttony, I want that food. Lust, I want that person. You know, um, avarice, I want that money. See the theme? I, I, me, me, I want, right? Um, it's like humility is so stressed in our church. And so when we get to the end of, of, of Holy Week, what do we have? You know, the extreme humility of the God who exists before all ages with all power and authority submits to be crucified and spit upon and slandered when he could have just vaporized everybody and said, get out of my way, I don't have to deal with any of this stuff. But the God of the universe submits to this. And in imitation of him, we come before one another in humility. You know, the remedy for this difficulty in confession is this. Um, if you're not sure or afraid to do whatever, we pray. We ask God to give us the strength. We fast um, to kind of remind us of this. And we have this mutual forgiveness where we ask other people. Notice it's interesting that we start Great Lent with forgiveness vespers. Um, and, you know, in most parishes, you know, I mean, everyone has little squabbles, I'm sure, parishes or, or families. But I don't think there's anybody really, I mean, there are, who are like, hate each other in a parish. And if you are, what the heck are you doing here, right? Um, so we have this thing, everyone's like, you know, oh, forgive you, oh, there's nothing to forgive, or slap each other in the back, and like, you know, everything kind of, you know, kind of, sometimes people make a joke out of it. And I read something once I thought was kind of interesting, that, you know, when we come before one another and ask for forgiveness, at forgiveness vespers, what we're saying, though, is not just that if I've offended you personally, there's that. But I see the image of God in you and you and me, and we're asking forgiveness of that in every person. It's like, oh, that's pretty profound. That's not like a, you know, fooling around, slapping on the back, eh, it's all good, whatever. 
it's something very powerful that we're asking forgiveness of the image of God in that person as we go around, and then we begin great fasting and prayer and go to churches. Right? Do all that stuff. You have no humility? It's useless. And so the church gives us this at the beginning, because if you don't get this down, the rest doesn't make any sense. And so we begin with this. And so in the mystery of, of repentance, we can, without shame or fear, confess our sins with faith before God as a loving Father, um, and so that nothing vile or unclean will remain in us to interfere with our lifelong striving to attain with all the saints a lifelong desire for the kingdom of heaven. And John says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Everything. But we have to come before him. And finally, the Orthodox Church strictly adheres to the teaching of the Bible that only God can forgive sins. In the West, there's this idea where, like, the priest is, like, becomes this thing where they kind of fill up with, like, the, the power he's charged, then he can forgive sins. That's not how it works with us. I do this on behalf of the Lord. It's not my power. It's not my authority at all. It's his. Uh, and it's forgiven through me as sinner, not by. I'm not the one that does it. Christ does it. And so, through his holy church, um, he gives us this, that we can make this uh, act of reconciliation so we can be forgiven of these things. We can like, unbind ourselves with these things and walk away in the way of his commandments. Um, and so this is divine slate clearing. A person can put their faults and misdeeds and consign them to oblivion and live a life new. Um, but talking about it, it needs to be stressed that it's the father of the prodigal son who we return to, we return to, to, forgive, to ask for forgiveness of. You know, God is not mad and pompously waits for us to kiss his feet. He runs out to meet us and overjoyed when we repent and says there's more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than if a righteous man enters the kingdom of God. So we have to come. Now it's the acceptable time. Everything's ready. We just have to come. Questions? Challenges? <laughs> Other? I'll, I'll lead off the question. Um, I was passing out uh, a guide to confession here when, uh, when you were talking about time and that kind of thing. What is your recommendation to your parishioners about how often they ought to confess? Well, it's kind of funny. I, I do it on a tier system. You know, there are some people who are like uh, on the, the peripheral of the parish. They come so often, you know, you're trying to get them more involved. And I would tell them, you need to come at least during the fasting period of the church. The people that come and know better, you know, they should come once a month, you know, at least. Or if something major is weighing on them, they just come. But the flip side is when people have like this, they, they take like OCD and, and remorse and like mix it together, and every little thing has to be confessed every single day, and you know, that can become, you know, we can play games with God. We go and we say this, we make our confession, we go out and do the same thing, come back, God forgives us, but but we're not doing anything about repenting of the sin. We're just saying the words. Well, that's not good. That's just playing games. We have to be sorry for it and make some kind of effort to change that. Um, and so, like, you know, we're, we're a product of how we're raised, right? So my family, when growing up, we went once a month. Like the last Saturday of every month, we went to confession. That's just what I was used to. And so that's what I told people. That's, you know, you know, as families, you're busy, whatever. Um, but I tell my parishioners, I will be available at any time. You call me 2 in the morning, I'll find the time, I'll come in my PJs, I'll throw my cassock over, I'll come to your confession. Because it's that important to do. And sometimes people with families, it's hard after Vespers because, you know, kids are there, whatever. Um, I have office hours, different times of the week, I say, come to one of those times, make an appointment, whatever. Um, but to make the, the opportunity, anytime people want to come, to hear this, you know. But, you know, to make, uh, to take advantage of it, to use it, because there's going to become a time when the book is open and there's no more confession. There's no more remorse. There's no more repentance. It's over. Right? You know, see the, the Ponte Crater on the, the dome? So when, um, sometimes when Christ is um, teaching, the book is open. When the book is shut, he's judging. You already should know what's in there and the book is shut now. And so when we see him in glory, there's no more teaching. There's no more, you know, what should we learn? No, no, you should know this by now. And now he's going to give an account, we have to give an account to him. He's going to judge what we have done with what he's taught us. Um, and so it's a kind of a, a new, a, a, a iconographic nuance that when the, the gospel is shut, he's standing in judgment over us. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what it means. I've always thought it was, was odd that our gospel was shut uh, 
Because you know, virtually every parish you go to, you're going to see the gospel open, Christ the teacher. Um, I've always wondered, like, why? Why, why different is different traditions. Yeah, I wonder the gospel yeah. stuff. But it's the um, idea. But it's the idea that you know there will come a time we have to you know give an account. You know, we're not universalists that God's just going to say, "Ah, oh, you're all forgiven in the end. Come on in." That's not what we believe. That's actually a heresy of the church. It was condemned by an ecumenical council. Um, but we have to give an account for what we have done. But if we are sorry for what we have done and come before him, of course he's going to forgive us. But we have to have that, that boldness, that strength to do it, that courage to do it. And it's hard. I get it. When I was ordained a deacon, I went for a life confession. You know, people that, that, that join the church later on, they make their life confession for their baptized whatever. But if you're raised in the church, you've never really done that because you've been going to confession since you were seven years old. So I prepared. I was going to do the whole thing. I'm going to think of everything I could possibly think of. I'm going, I'm, I cheated on Monopoly when I was seven years old. I'm, you know, and the father was like, down. <laughs> you know, let, let's break this down. Uh, so what I, I tell people to do is, you know, in the West they have like the seven deadly sins, love that kind of thing. Uh, I like it for the sense of organization. Take those sins and then lay them out. You know, okay, so from gluttony, here's what I've done. From avarice, here's what I've done. From lust, here's what I've done. Pride, here's what I've done. Anger, what I've done. And it helps me on my head kind of organize the thing. But it's not so much that, you know, I got angry 732 times. Great. Uh, the problem is, you have an anger problem. That's what needs to be worked on. Not just that you did it all these times, you're forgiven, go, you know, go do it again. I mean, what are you going to do about that? And that's the job of the priest, to hear these things, patterns, and think, ah, I think we got a problem here. We need to address this, or whatever. Um, and then start to kind of help the person get this stuff out of our system. Um, it's, it's kind of like um, my analogy I use for confession. I, I, I'm a person that can't, like, I, I hate throwing up, like, since I was a kid. Like, I, I have a phobic. I, I would rather slam my toe in a sliding glass door and have to puke, right? But going to confession is just like that. Because you know that feeling. You know, when you wake up in the middle of the night, it's not if, it's when, it's going to happen, how are we going to do this, right? Uh, and you come to confession, you know, you know it's going to happen. Father comes out, oh, it's time, oh, i got to do this. And you go up and it all comes out. You feel like you're going to be turned inside out. And you're like, oh, this is terrible. He's going to get so mad at me. And you're done, you're like, ah, oh, this is great, <laughs> you know? And you can, like, fly out of the church. And then 20 minutes later, it starts again, right? And then we're back to where we started again. But that's kind of how it is. I mean, it's difficult. It's hard. You know, there's even a really neat Greek icon that has a guy confessing and snakes are kind of coming out of his mouth. And each snake has a sin written on it. You know, he's vomiting these things out. It's kind of like, cool. Um, but it's how it feels when you're really given a good confession. You get it all out of your system. Um, it's hard. But the reward of that is so great afterwards. Because we can forgive each other, and that's something, right? If you offend me, I can offend you, and we forgive well, each other. Well, we're required to. Yes, we can. Yeah. So we use those words interchangeably, but I think when it comes to, um, you know, the, the, the sacramental aspect of it, I mean, like I said, there's things that we confess to God every day in our prayer corner that, you know, God forgives it. Sure, whatever. Um, but to go to confession here, a human voice, say, you are forgiven, go in peace. There's something healing to that. And I think... God in his divine mercy allows this kind of thing to happen that we would hear that and be healed by that, those words. Um, because yeah, I mean, of course I believe God forgives my sins. But he never said it, you know. But when we hear someone who represents the church say those words, man, that's a powerful thing. You know, even now I go to confession when the priest says those words, like you feel a weight taken off your shoulders. You believe it, you have to believe it, but to hear it, it's just something powerful. Is there more than that though? It sounds like No, there's something happening there. But I have to believe it. Like I said, the people who don't forgive themselves and live their life, you know, like, they're still mopey. Well, you're, you're forgiven by God. Doesn't that mean something? You know, there has to be, you know, it's, it's everything we do in the church is divine synergy, right? Not just God or just us. We do it together. I mean, the truth of the matter is God always does the lion's share of all the work. But we have to do it with him. So I have to come and make this confession. I have to believe that God can forgive my sins and accept that forgiveness and live my life in reflection of that forgiveness by then going and doing something different. Not just going back to the same thing and then we're back to the same square one. That's no good. That's a spin on our wheel. And so many people in our society, that's what they do. You know, they say they're sorry, but they go back to the same thing. Well, how are you healing? How are you getting, how's that bettering you at all? And you're not. And that's why people are so frustrated and angry, whatever, because you're just, they can't get out of the rut. 
because the church gives us these other tools to help us in all this, prayer, fasting, the services, and we use all these things together to further ourselves to the kingdom. But, you know, God can't force us to do this. No, he won't force us. Um, I always say that God, uh, God won't fix stupid, right? He can, but he won't. Um, when we were building our building in Mechanicsburg, um, you know, we're, it was a $1.8 million project, and if I had my druthers, it would be $5.8 million with, like, you know, marble columns or anything else. But um, with 130 parishioners at the time, you know, not our budget. So I always said that God won't fix stupid. We could have paid, tried to do that, and God would be like, all right, go do it, you're going to tank. Or we could do something that's more practical. You know, so I think that, you know, for us, that, you know, it's not just me or how I feel, what I think, uh, but it's us coming in connection with the living God, that he meets us, you know. It's beautiful. In the, the older days, we kind of lost it sometimes because we're always afraid of, like, you know, um, H, or, um, ADA compliance and everything else. It used to be when communion happened, the priest stood at the door. Here. You would step up the steps and come to the doorway where heaven and earth met and receive communion. This synergy of it happening. And we're afraid of people falling down as we come down there. Um, but there's something, in Alaska, they still do this. These little old ladies are still going up the stairs. It's beautiful, really. Um, but the priest brings the, the chalice to the doors, and the person comes to the doors and receives communion there. Again, the synergy between us and God. Um, and everything we do has that. It's not just, you know, about what I want or what I think. It's what God gives to us. We meet him in the middle. Um, but like the Father, he runs to him. Right? He does the, 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 the bigger portion of it. Um, but how we respond to it, that's the, that's the key. What do we do with it? Father Hopko of blessed memory, he said that, what did the son do the next day? I was like, what, 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 what? I didn't hear, what are you talking about? He said the next day the son said to his dad, eh, I don't want this anymore, I'm leaving. And he left. And a couple days later he came back, and the father received him again. And the next day he said, eh, I'm leaving again. And he left. A couple days later he came back. And he said, how do you know that that's what happened? I'm like, I don't know, because that's what we do all the time. We're forever coming back into the bosom of the Father and like, eh, let me do our sins together. And then we come back and then we go out and we come back and go out. And God receives us every time. Um, there's something powerful in that. You know? That, you know, we, we sometimes give God this, we, we make God in our image, we make him petty. You know, oh, you're back again. <laughs> you know, 13th time this month you confess that. He doesn't do that. Like you said, when the, the kid comes back and confesses it, the Father doesn't say anything about what he had done. He just turns and says, put a fat a cap, put a robe on him, a ring on his finger, a fan on his feet, and let's have a party. I think that, you know, the healing that takes place in confession is knowing that, that our God desires that. He doesn't desire our punishment. He desires our healing and our life. You're going to hear on Sunday, the Gospel reading says, depart of the, the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. It's not prepared for us. It's prepared for the demons. We want to jump into it. That's our business by our choice. But he doesn't prepare it for us. He prepares the kingdom for us. But again, we have a role in our choice and what we want to do and what we don't want. And God, in his divine mercy, and I don't, even, I don't even begin to try to understand this, but he allows it. He allows us to say, the heck with you, Lord, and do it. He's all right, fine. And he patiently waits for us. I, uh, I always think about one uh, Holy Thursday night we sing, Glory to thy long suffering, O Lord, 12 times. I don't think that's, that's uh, just for like the cross. I think there's a sense of God suffers over the sin of the world until the second coming because we would reject him even now. I mean, he's done all this stuff for us. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection, the, you know, the Pentecost, the whole, send the Holy Spirit, the whole church, giving us everything. St. Basil the Great says, all things have been given unto us. And we'd be like, eh, nothing. You know, yikes. You know, really, and there's a sense that after Pentecost, God, there's nothing else for God to do. Unless, until he comes in glory. He's given everything to us. He's given everything we need for our life and for our salvation. What do we need? We've been told everything. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We have the church. We have communion. What else do we need? He's given it to us. It's, it's over. When he comes again in glory, he's going to make an account for it. So, you know, from God's perspective, he's done everything he possibly can. We just have to respond to it. And we have all kinds of opportunities to do it. The question is, do we do it? I think everything that, that we see in the church always, what is our response to it? You know, 
Christ became man so we can become like God. What's our response to it? Christ has redeemed the whole world. You know, do we live in reflection of that redemption? You know, Christ has forgiven our sins. Do we believe that? You know, we forgive the other person because he's forgiven us. What's our response to the things God has given to us? And for many people, the response is, eh, you know. And as a pastor, that bothers me. Because in the book of Revelation, you know, you know that, you know, the way of the sea in church, you know, they were lukewarm. They're not either hot nor cold. They spit you out. They just vomit you out. But I like vomiting. But, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know and that's a visceral thing. What is our response? So, um, general confession, group confession, I've heard this before. Um, in like the 50s and 60s, you know, actually before that, a lot of times, like in the Metropolia, the, the church before the OCA, um, when that church was, you know, kind of functioning, the revolution that happened in Russia, they were sending no priests over from Russia, so there was no, like, education. So the education here was kind of, you know, uh, and so a lot of places it was like, hey, you got a good voice. You know, come here. You know, <laughs> the greatest divine. Like, this is ordained people without proper education. Not a good idea, by the way. Um, and so a lot of people just didn't know. Over the years, things like confession fell out of practice because people just didn't know. There's a whole period of time where people didn't go to communion regularly. You know, my father grew up. They went to communion twice a year. I was scandalized when I heard that. But that was just what they did. They went on a Lazarus Saturday and Bright Monday were like the two times they went a year. And if someone went to communion during the year, you're either going to the hospital or they're dying. Right? You know, because you just didn't go to communion. I'm like, that makes no sense to me. But that was like the normal thing. And so confession, nobody went to confession that they were dying. Um, and so people like Father Alexander Schmemann, the blessed memory, he was the one that said, wait a minute. The church taught, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're not doing it. And so he kind of got people back up and running with it. And one of the things that the general confession was a way to kind of start people to think about this. So basically what would happen is, you know, after Vespers, everybody would be here. The priest would come up, give a reflection, read a list of sins. You're supposed to think about these things. Come up afterwards with a prayer of absolution. And then over time, you would have your private confession. The problem was that people said, this is easy. And just didn't do the private part and just started doing the general confession. So the church said, eh, we're not doing anything. Um, it didn't really catch, catch on in many places other than to be easier. Um, and most priests, as good pastors, just kind of got rid of it because it was being abused. Um, my father-in-law was great. He, uh, he's been a priest 60 years. And uh, so people come up to him and say, oh, just general confession, Father. You know, or just absolutely. He goes, okay. So he puts a stone in the head. And he starts talking to him, asking me questions. And they, you know, so basically he got a confession out of him before, like, you know, not forcing him. <laughs> you know, um, it's like, you know, a jet, a judo flip. You know, um, but yeah, it was it, 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 it was a thing done to get people into a regular practice of confession. But a lot of times, as we humans are, we find the shortcut around it. This is easier than that, so we'll start doing that. He wasn't doing it. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's okay. You know, you know, I always tell people that uh, the job of the priest is to comfort the afflicted and the afflict the comfortable. So, you know, works both ways. Those of you who know, you know with Father John Reeves, you know that. <laughs> You're a friend of mine. Anybody else? Yes. so crazy about that kind of stuff, like, you know, because obviously there's something we're going to forget. Right? I don't care if you confess, or if you come up to communion, and Father hands all the chalice, confesses you right there and gives you communion, you're still not prepared. But we're never prepared. God makes us worthy, right? We're not worthy on ourselves. Um, and so, you know, if we forget something, all right, you know, unless it's like, oh, oh I forgot to tell him I shot that person. Well, maybe we should turn around and go back, you know. Um, <laughs> but generally speaking, we usually forget something, whatever, so write it down and save it for the next time. Or if it's something that's really bothering you, then maybe the next morning, say before liturgy, Father, I forgot to mention blah, 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 whatever. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're, we get so caught up in the thing, we're not really, we're, we're just, it's like a, um, uh, like a, uh, how do I want to use it? Um, like some kind of a spiritual function, but we're not really doing the thing we're supposed to do. It's not just saying the thing, because we have to say the thing. Well, are you doing something about the thing that in the future to change your life, to stop doing that? You know, I mean, we could say it as much as we can, but we're not doing anything with it. We're not fooling God. 
You know? Now, there's one thing if you know, we're really trying, we fall. And we, we, fall, we can come back to God, fine. But there's another thing we just kind of like, eh, just say it, that's what we say. You know, back in the time, there was a, this kind of prayer that people said, I have sinner test for a mighty God, for all the dead, done, blah, blah. It's like this little, like, thing. Well, okay, but people just say that, that's it. Well, they're just rattling it off. But do you actually do these things? What, what are you confessing? Not just the prayer, but, you know, what things have you personally done? You know, there's a story of one uh, church father that uh, someone came to him and said, well, Father, I've done everything. Everything? Oh, yeah, everything. Okay. So you stole horses? Well, no. You killed people? Well, well, no. Well, obviously, you haven't done everything. What have you done? And start there, you know? And so, you know, you can have it both ways. I've done nothing wrong. Or I've done it all, Father. <laughs> okay, you know? Um, and it's usually somewhere in the middle. Right? Because obviously, we've done something wrong. Um, but, you know... It's not about just kind of glazing over. It's taking into account what I have done, what I am sorry for, and confessing that before God. And it's hard. There's no way around it. Protestants is the scripture says literally that Christ gave the authority to his disciples to do this, and they to their disciples to do this. That's why we have apostolic succession, those who are you know, passed down from generation to generation. So, you know, that's where it is in scripture. Okay? It, it, on the day of Pascha, the first day of Pascha, he's risen from the dead, the first thing he tells them is, you know, you have this power. You know, I mean, you can use all kind of mental acrobatics to get around that, and like, that's what it meant. That's what it meant, you know, and that's what it, it did. Um, and then the, the epistles of John, he talks about confessing your sins to one another. I mean, this, it shouldn't be like, you know, like rocket science to people because it's, it's clearly the practice of the early church that they would confess to one another. They would come to the elders. They would pray over them, forgive them their sins. So they had the power given to them by Christ. But see, what happens is in a Protestant mindset, you've taken the whole mystical part of the church and thrown it out the window. So it has to be what it is. There's no anything else. And so they don't know what to do with all that because it's just magic mumbo-jumbo stuff. And for us, it's like, no, that's, that's the power of the church. That's the, the spiritual dimension of all these things that they just have no concept to understand. So what I try to do when I explain to people is not explain to them like they're orthodox, try to find a way to kind of speak their language. You know, I joke I went to Catholic school for 12 years, so I speak Roman fluently, right? <laughs> um, try to explain it the way they would understand it from their perspective. Because what happens sometimes is we, like, we give the orthodox answer to a Protestant question, just not connecting at all. Um, I think we don't do a very good job of this evangelically in, the, in, like, in churches. Uh, there was a parish one time that they were Holy Dormition of the Most Holy Theotokos Orthodox Church, Divine Liturgy, 9.30, Great Vespers, not at 6 p.m. And like the only thing the average American knew of that, that whole thing was uh, the, and the times. Like, what is a Theotokos <laughs> liturgy? Because, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get them to see this, not we know what that is, but they don't know what that is. Uh, Father John Matusiak, a blessed memory, his church had a sign that said, church, error. <laughs> um, but, uh, so how do, we, how do we explain it to people in the way they can understand it? And what happens is, though, sometimes like, you have to back the truck up because, okay, well, it's the authority given by Christ. Oh, well, apostolic succession, they don't understand that. We've got to back up and explain that. Oh, well, then we have to explain the, the role of the apostles. Okay, that, blah, blah, that. And so by the time we're getting to the question, we're like six questions back because they don't understand the foundation of what all this stuff means. Uh, that's what frustrates me when, when people like that come to my parish because they, they want an orthodox answer for a Protestant question and sometimes like there's no quick way to do that. You know? And when we do, we do a disservice to our church because we like, we like to get the quick answer. You know? What's the difference between you and Catholics? Well, our priests can marry, our altars face this way, we have no pool. No, 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 you know? That's the one everyone likes to give, but that's not really accurate. You know? There's a lot more than that. There are a lot more serious things that are different between the two churches. Um, but what happens is that, you know, we, we try to find an answer that will that make them happy. Well, I would say don't worry about making them happy. Be honest with the truth. 
And let the Augustine of Hippo has a great line. He said, the truth is like a lion. Let it out. It'll take care of itself. Right? Just say what we believe. And if they don't like it, that's okay. Fine. You know? Um, what I found is that, and this, I, 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 I struggle saying this because of the context of the last few years, but orthodoxy can be kind of like a virus to some people. Once it gets in your system, it just takes over after a while. We had a lady one time that, like, she came to Orthodox Church and she hated it because, you know, all this, you know, this incense and candles and idol worship, this is just terrible. And then she, like, stormed out of the church and, you know, didn't come for a couple weeks. We had to come back and make sure she hated it, right? And then she came again and again and again. It's like, it's a goner, you know? Uh, as, a, as a priest, there's certain things that people do that I know it's, they, they're past the point of no return, you know? They, they complain about icons and the mother of God. I'm like, yeah, yeah keep going, yeah, right? And then, and then once they get over that, it's like, it's like an avalanche, and then everything just falls into place. Um, but it takes time, because we live in a world, this world is not of this, of this world, right? We, this is not like that. So we still live in the world that St. John the Divine testifies of, right? The book of Revelation, right? Now, the worship was beautiful tonight, and the choir was beautiful, really, the service was served beautifully. This worship is not like the world. It's something different. So people come here and see something that's like, this doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before. Good! That's what it looks like anything else. It's the, it's the kingdom. And so they see something that's completely different. And our explanations of things sometimes are very foreign to them because their, 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 their mindset, um, their paradigms are just completely different than what we understand as the church. And part of our job as Orthodox Christians is acquiring that mindset more and more that we understand things from the church's perspective, not the world's perspective which has been kind of the thing at odds the last two years. The world tells us do this, and the church says, well, we do this, and we're, you know, things, things seem like evening out now. Um, but we have a way that we respond to things. Pandemics and, you know, governments and things. We have a way we respond to it. We, we're pretty good at it for 2,000 years. We're doing it. And then we seem to forgot that, you know? Um, but, you know, when people come, it's good they ask these questions. We have a place that, an atmosphere where we're welcoming them to answer these questions. But you don't have to feel you have to make people happy with the answer. Because there's certain things that, you know, are not meant to make us happy. They're meant to make us holy, you know. Um, and sometimes, you know, or most times, there's sacrifice involved in that. And as Americans, we don't like sacrifice. You know, we don't want to get hard. We want it easy. We want to do it the easy way. Um, and if you want the easy way, there's the doors. I mean, this is not the easy way here, uh, especially the next couple of weeks. <laughs> We're not doing things the easy way in the next couple of weeks. It's hard. Lent is hard. Confession is hard. Fasting is hard. Praying is hard. And if you say it's not, you're not doing it right. Um, Father Sarah from Rose has a great line. It says that um, if your version of orthodoxy is easy, it's not orthodoxy. It's something else you've stamped the orthodox church on. But it's not orthodoxy. Uh, because the church is a cross. We have to carry it. But the end result is the kingdom. Not just recognition or whatever, or somebody is happy because we have a good answer that she likes us down because we agree with her theology or something. Um, you know, when I was first ordained, I was always afraid of that. Like, you know, oh, I gotta say the right thing or they're, they might get angry. Now I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't care. I mean, if you're angry, be angry at Christ, not me. It's his church. I'm just the messenger. You know, and it's not my job to monkey with it. You know, I mean, Father and I, we, it's not our opinions. I can't say, I think we should do no. What does Christ say? What does the church say? What does the Father say? That's what I say. You know, and somebody says, what's your opinion of this? What does St. Basil say? That's what he says. I agree with him. Right? Because he knows it better than I do. Right? So I think that part of it is when people come, um, don't be afraid of, you know, make sure they understand it. Just say what we believe. Because eventually what's going to happen is five years from now, this lady's going to remember that conversation. It's going to click. I know what she meant by that. And then it's all going to fall into place. But sometimes it takes time. I've heard um, instructors before I say when you're in, uh, give, going to confession, um, should it be too detailed? And is that, that whole idea about what it's looking for is the things you need to work on and change? Is that just because that the details don't really do any good for that? I think it depends. Because some people like to be general to get out of it. You know, I had an impure thought. <laughs> okay, you know, or you know, I have gluttony. Well, did you eat 17 cheesecakes, or is it like, you know, what, what do you, what, what's the issue here? So I think sometimes you have to have um, not detail, but sometimes explain the sin to the priest. And if you're doing it to get around it, 
you're missing the point of confession. If you're doing the like hide what you really have done or whatever. Um, but then the flip side of it is when you like get into all the detail and the priest is like, please, I don't need to know this, you know. Um, you know, thank you. Um, mute, 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 you know. Um, <laughs> so there, it, the Orthodox Church, if, if, if anything, it's sanity and balance. So you have to balance these things. So there's, you have to be honest with your confession. But there are things that like are, are too much. Like I had somebody once that went to confession, like for 15 minutes they're telling me this story, and I'm like, where are we going with this? Like, where's the the, the sin part? You know what? What you had for dinner, and what your road you're on, and what car you're driving. I don't. That, that that's not part of this. And I think sometimes when people are nervous, they just talk all the, the details just to kind of get around it, just spit it out. You know. Um, I think that's what what happens sometimes. So it's it's not one or the other. It's confess it honestly, so you confess the sin. But, you know, save the priest back for crying out loud. Sometimes you're there for a half hour and you don't speak the word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I confess if I went too long, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is such an important thing. So thank you, Father, for inviting me to speak about it. Um, you know, take advantage of it. You know, I, I know that, you know, Father's, you know, two years here now? About two years. years. It takes time. I have people in my parish that, like, I would say there are seven, eight years before I could really get in and start dealing with people on a one-to-one basis. You know, kind of fill you out. You know? But um, it's it's a relationship. It takes time. It takes effort. You know, on on Father's part and on yours too. Because like I said, we can't force ourselves into your life. I'm there 17 years. There's still some nuts I haven't cracked in my parish that I just I, you know, what have you done? Got angry? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Gossip. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Sorry. You know, like you can't get in there because they don't want you to know anything about their life. You know, I can't force that. I can't make that happen. Relationships are two people, right? You have a relationship with God. You know, He's not going to force it, right? We have to kind of open ourselves up to Him as well. Uh, God is so patient and loving that He's not going to force us into His kingdom. Look at the Book of Revelation. The door, there's no doors in the kingdom. You want to go in? Get in. You want to leave? Get out. It doesn't force us to do anything. Do you want this? And if you do, then do this. If you don't, well, there's, there's an alternative to that. We'll hear about that on Sunday. Uh, you know, but there, there's a relationship that needs to be developed, and that takes time. And so, you know, that's, it behooves us to do that. Okay. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. All right. Well, shall we pray? Is it truly meet?